Thank you so much for joining us today for the American Heart Association's Diabetes and Your Heart educational webinar featuring Dr. Robert Groves and brought to you by Banner Aetna. My name is Corinne Kleinschmidt and I am the Vice President of Health for the Greater Phoenix American Heart Association and we're very excited to bring this digital experience to you via Zoom today. Before we get started, there are a few housekeeping things I do want to take care of. First, we are recording this session so it can be available to you afterwards. Tomorrow morning, you will receive an email with a copy of the presentation slides and a link to the recording for today. So if you miss something, don't worry, you will have access to all the information after the webinar. Also, you might have noticed live captions are turned on automatically for all attendees. If you'd prefer to experience today's event without captions, all you have to do is click on the live transcript button at the bottom of your Zoom toolbar, and then you select hide subtitle. For those who don't use Zoom on a daily basis like myself, I'll go over a couple of tips to help you uh, enjoy today's session better. First, you can change the view that you have. All you have to do is click the word view in the top right corner of your Zoom screen. There's several different options. When you came on, it's kind of the default reselected, but you can click and see which one you like the best. Some make the speakers larger or the PowerPoint slide. It's up to you and how you want to enjoy. Next, let's make sure we all know how to ask questions. When you joined the webinar, you were given this a main event window, but you can add a chat window. To do that, you can see on the slide, it has a picture of what it looks like. You can remove the chat window by just clicking chat and it'll come down or you add it by clicking chat. You can also move it around if it's in the way by kind of grabbing it at the top and dragging it with your mouse. When you have the chat window open, you can type in responses and questions. And we encourage you to select all panelists and attendees or everyone so that everyone can see your questions uh, as you're submitting them. So let's test what we've learned. Open your chat box and type in the answer to this question. Untreated diabetes can lead to cardiovascular disease. True or false? I am opening up my chat window. Uh, when I'm pulling up my chat window, Alicia, I don't see the responses people are typing in. Although I am seeing some folks are using the question um, and answer box as well. Do you see responses in the chat box, Dr. Gross? I do see responses in the chat box and just about everybody is getting it right. Ah, excellent. That is what we like to hear. So true, untreated diabetes can lead to cardiovascular disease. During the presentation today, please type your questions and comments into the chat box or into the Q&A box and make sure you always send it to that all panelists and attendees or to everyone so that at the end of the presentation, if we have time, we can answer as many questions as possible. As we get started, I'd like to give special thanks though to our sponsor, Banner Aetna, for making this event possible. We're excited to work with them to provide this information about diabetes and heart disease to the community. Banner Aetna is, Arizona, is an Arizona health insurance company that leverages the strengths of two of the largest healthcare organizations in Arizona. That's Banner Health and Aetna. So thank you so much, Banner Aetna, for all of your support. And today I'm especially happy to welcome Dr. Robert Groves, who's the Executive Vice President and Chief Medical Officer for Banner Aetna. In his current role, Dr. Groves is responsible for population health management. He received his MD from the Medical College of Georgia and previously served as the Chief Medical Officer for the Banner Health Network. Today, he's gonna to explain what diabetes is, including the types of diabetes, the symptoms, how it's diagnosed, the risks, and how to treat it. He's also going to discuss how you can help not only yourself, but those around you. Dr. Groves? Thank you so much, Corinne. Well, welcome everybody. And uh, there are a few topics 
that are more important than diabetes. And uh, when you have diabetes, what's going on is that your body is unable to process carbohydrates or it's unable to process sugar. It doesn't make enough insulin to actually allow your cells to use that sugar. And so what happens basically is when you eat, when you have something to eat, your body can't use its own insulin as it should. Uh, that's the other possible cause of it. There are uh, two different names for those types of diabetes. You've probably heard those before, type one and type two. Let's get all of them up there, yeah. Or both, uh, it can sometimes uh, uh, be a result of failure of your body to use its own insulin. And other times it can be due to the body's not making insulin at all. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, so how does diabetes develop? And again, let's, uh, there we go. Let's bring them all out there. There we go. So uh, when you eat food, your digestive system makes uh, or, or breaks it down and then it's absorbed through your intestines into the bloodstream. And your blood sugar level will normally go up. What's supposed to happen when your blood sugar goes up is insulin is released from the pancreas and that insulin signals the cells in your muscles and other parts of the body, your brain, et cetera, that there's insulin, that there's blood sugar around that they can take up into the cells. And that's what's supposed to happen. That blood sugar goes directly into the cell where it's used in the energy engine of your body. And next slide. Now, uh, what happens in diabetes is that again, either your body is resistant to insulin or you're not making enough of it. And so the cells aren't getting that fuel and they start to go into starvation. And over time, high blood sugar levels uh, will damage the eyes, the kidneys, the nerves, or the heart. It really has wide ranging effects throughout the body. And next slide, please. Now let's talk about the types again for a second. We've talked about this already. Uh, there's type one diabetes, also referred to as insulin dependent diabetes. And in type one diabetes, what's going on is the pancreas, which is near the stomach, really just doesn't make insulin. And it's thought that this is due to an autoimmune disease. In other words, uh, uh, something like rheumatoid arthritis, but in rheumatoid arthritis, your body's own immune system attacks the joints. Well, in this case, it's attacking what are called islet cells in the pancreas, knocking them out of commission. And so your body's not making insulin. And in the absence of insulin, you simply can't function. So type one diabetics are also known as insulin dependent diabetics. It used to be called juvenile onset diabetes. There are a couple of reasons that uh, that has changed. One is because it can happen at any age. It's more common in kids, but it can happen at any age. The other reason is a little bit less uh, encouraging and that's because type two diabetes is increasingly being diagnosed in children. Uh, and that's a really bad sign because it used to be that we would never see type 2 diabetes under the age of 40. And we're starting to see that now. And it's probably a combination of, of obesity and inactivity and diet that are leading to this unfortunate uh, uh, consequence. And next slide. Let's talk about type 2 diabetes. And uh, that's the most common form. In fact, about 95% of diabetics are type two. And type two diabetes uh, occurs when something called insulin resistance happens. And there's a whole sequence of events that starts with the, uh, the pancreas increasing production of insulin because as your cells become more resistant to it, the body tries to make more so that it can you know, signal the cells that it's okay to uptake glucose but it increasingly the body is not able to produce insulin and the pancreas can give out over time. And this kind of diabetes really can uh, go undiagnosed for many years, particularly if it's mild. The other thing that I would say is uh, this whole process of, and we'll talk about in uh, one of the additional slides here, prediabetes, 
it really is a process that starts with increased insulin levels. We don't routinely measure that, but in pre-diabetics, you can demonstrate that the level of insulin is high. And even before the onset of pre-diabetes, you'll start to see that spike in insulin. Uh, by the way, you can control this with diet and exercise. And I'll talk about why that is in, in just a second. Let's go to the next slide. There we go, pre-diabetes, why does that matter? Well, it, basically, if you have a, a level of hemoglobin A1C that's not normal, but it's not high enough over uh, equal to or over 6.5, if it's in between that 5.6 to 6.5 range, that means that you're pre-diabetic. And so that means the process is ongoing. Not everybody that has pre-diabetes progresses to diabetes, but certainly the risk is dramatically increased if you have prediabetes. And as with diabetes type two, there are things that you can do to reduce the risk of progressing to diabetes and even reversing it. And go ahead. All right. How many Americans have diagnosed and undiagnosed diabetes? Okay, the chat box appears to be disabled for some reason, so please use the Q&A box to type in the answer for, um, for our question. Hmm, the answers seem to be all over the place, Dr. Groves. Yes, it does seem to be all over the place, and this is, uh, this is uh, a little bit of a trick question because uh, we have numbers above and below the real answer, which is a little bit uh, tricky. Okay, let's take a look at the result here. And you tell me if you got it right. 30 plus million. Now, it's interesting if one includes a combination of something called the metabolic syndrome, which I think we talked a little bit about previously, uh, and type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes, prediabetes, and obesity. These are all related syndromes. And if you add all those up, more than half of the United States adult population has one of those disorders. Uh, so that's a sobering uh, fact. And, and the reason it's a, a concern is because it can lead to so many other diseases. As many as half of everybody over 65 in the US has one of those uh, problems called prediabetes. And unfortunately, there are still a lot of folks walking around that don't know that they have either that precursor to diabetes or even diabetes itself. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, what are the symptoms? Well, uh, prediabetes, you may not know that you have it at all. In type one and type two, the symptoms are pretty much the same. Increased thirst, because when you have all that sugar in your blood, it uh, causes you to make a lot more urine. So you have to replace that water somehow. Uh, because your cells are starved for energy, appetite is increased. And again, because they're starved for energy, you may experience fatigue. We talked about why you urinate. Uh, you may even have weight loss if you have undiagnosed diabetes, and that is once again because of that energy deficit in the cell. Oftentimes there's blurred vision. Uh, with type 1 diabetics, they may have a fruity odor to the breath, and in type 2 specifically, there are often sores that have trouble healing. So how do we diagnose it? There are basically three ways uh, to diagnose diabetes. One we've talked about briefly, it's the hemoglobin A1C. And what that does, and, and by the way, this is the most common test. And uh, many of you I'm sure have heard of this because it's been recommended to you or a family member. And what that does is it measures the amount of glucose that's stuck to your red blood cells. And uh, over time, we can tell over the last three months, what the average blood sugar has been by looking at uh, the hemoglobin A1C. Now, when, uh, if you want to think about this, if it's stuck to your blood cells, it turns out it's stuck to lots of other things throughout your body. 
And that may be one of the reasons that a high blood sugar leads to all these problems. And in particular, it leads to problems in the smaller blood vessels of the body rather than the larger ones. So it's microvascular disease. The other way we can diagnose it is called a fasting plasma glucose. You've probably had fasting blood drawn before. Uh, and uh, what that means is that after you have fasted for usually overnight, a good uh, eight to 12 hours or so, your blood sugar should be below 126. If it's 126 or over, uh, at least two occasions, then that means that you have one of the diagnostic tests that's positive for diabetes. The other, the third way uh, is an oral glucose tolerance test. And in that case, they give you a whole bunch of glucose, a whole bunch of sugar, and then measure how your body processes that over a couple of hours. Okay. I was going to say, and that's the one they give a lot of women who are pregnant, correct? Yes, it is indeed. Yes. Yeah. It tastes awful. <laughs> and that's the, that's the third kind of diabetes that we'll touch briefly on today, which is uh, gestational diabetes or diabetes of pregnancy. And while that usually goes away after delivery, it increases the risk for type 2 diabetes. Now let's talk about the increased risk for nerve damage. Over time, those high blood sugars can damage nerves, uh, particularly in diabetics. Uh, the diabetic neuropathy tends to be in the hands and feet. And that's a real problem with the feet because the elevated sugar in the blood already increases the risk of infection. And now you can no longer feel uh, if you've maybe had an injury to your foot and the foot can be significantly damaged and someone who's had diabetes for a while simply won't feel it. And that's why the doctor often takes a very close look at the feet in diabetics to make sure that there's not some unrecognized sore that's developing that's not going to heal without intervention. There's an increased risk for Alzheimer's disease and dementia, particularly in older age. And so uh, this is something that we should all be concerned about. Alzheimer's is also a disease that's escalating rapidly, increasing incidents across the United States. And so we want to pay attention to anything that can increase the risk for uh, Alzheimer's. Heart and blood vessel damage, type 2 diabetes, definitely increases your risk of cardiovascular disease. And these complications are the most, or one of the most common in diabetics, uh, atherosclerosis, which is just another way of saying uh, damage throughout the body's blood vessels, uh, peripheral artery disease, and can happen in the legs, it can happen in the kidneys, it can happen in the brain and lead to stroke, or of course it can happen in the heart and lead to myocardial infarction or a heart attack. There are other organs that are put at risk uh, by diabetes as well. Uh, kidneys are commonly damaged with long-term diabetics, and they may even be damaged to the point that they have to go on dialysis, kidney replacement therapy, if you will, because the kidneys have been so injured by long-standing di uh, diabetes. Eye damage up to and including blindness can occur with diabetes. Foot damage we talked about, but uh, it is the number one reason that people have to have amputations. If the infection from the foot gets too bad and starts moving up the leg, sometimes the only option is to amputate that leg. Uh, skin and mouth conditions are very common, and type 1 diabetics have a particularly increased risk of osteoporosis or thinned out bones uh, that increase the risk of fractures. Twenty six million diagnosed and nine point four million. Every two minutes in the United States, an adult with diabetes is hospitalized for stroke. And while 26 million American adults have been diagnosed with diabetes, an estimated nine point four million have diabetes but don't know it. When you have type 2 diabetes, your risk to have a stroke is higher than for people that don't have diabetes. In fact, it's about two times as high. When the blood sugar is high over time, unhealthy changes happen in the blood vessels. 
With this can come plaques and blockages inside the blood vessels, and when a portion of the brain is not able to get the blood flow it needs, that's when strokes can happen. People with diabetes and prediabetes are at increased risk for stroke, but they can live long, healthy lives free from heart disease and stroke by taking steps to stay healthy and control their risk factors. The good news is diabetes can be managed and the risk for stroke can be lowered. I tell my patients who have diabetes who want to lower their stroke risk that first of all, they should pay very close attention to following their medication regimen exactly, but they should also identify other risk factors that they may also have that could be associated that increase risk of stroke. Most important of all, I, I want them to become aware of lifestyle changes that they might make that would significantly lower their chances to have a stroke in the future. Some of these are targeting an ideal weight, targeting a good amount of exercise, and eating a healthy diet. In addition, taking steps like not smoking, limiting alcohol, and learning to manage your stress can have a significant impact on your overall health. Talking to your healthcare provider can help you manage these factors and help you stay on track. You should really make yourself aware and teach your family too about the signs and symptoms of stroke. Strokes in people with diabetes look just like strokes for people who don't have diabetes. Use FAST to spot a stroke. If you experience face drooping, arm weakness, or speech difficulty, call 911 immediately. Additional symptoms of stroke can include numbness, confusion, trouble seeing, trouble walking, and severe headache. Having diabetes increases your risk of stroke, but it's important to remember you're not alone. If you have type 2 diabetes, talk to your healthcare provider and visit stroke.org for more information. Take the next step in lowering your risk right now. A nice quick review of uh, the stroke uh, symptoms that you need to be aware of. So now let's ask another question. This is a tough one, actually. Who should be tested for pre-diabetes and diabetes? And A, it's people over age 45. B is people younger than 45 who are overweight. People younger than 45 who are overweight and have high blood pressure. People younger than 45 who are overweight with family history of diabetes. And then E is a combination of A, C, and D. Let's see how everybody does on this one. Responses are coming in quick. And it looks like E is the unanimous suggestion. Poss uh, yeah. uh, possibly a, a good option there, E. Yep, turns out that's the case. And, and uh, the one outlier there is the under 45 and overweight. And uh, you require two risk factors to, to justify testing before the age of 45. And that's why that one was excluded. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Okay, what are non-modifiable risk factors? In other words, these are the things that we can't do anything about. If our risk is increased because of family history, because of our race or ethnic background, our age, uh, or uh, during pregnancy, those things, uh, you know, once we're there, uh, we can't change them easily. And, and uh, with family history, that's obvious. Race and ethnic background, it really is uh, those of African, Asian, uh, uh, Native American, Pacific Islander, descent are at increased risk of diabetes. And age uh, risk increases as we get older, and those we can't change. However, there are things that we can change. Certainly, uh, uh, it's going to be obvious to you what those things are, as you've already uh, seen in the video, the lifestyle issues. So working on weight, trying to target uh, your ideal weight or body mass index, as it were, uh, physical activity, which, you know, on average, if you get 
a brisk walk, 30 minutes, uh, you know, five days a week, that's going to meet uh, the activity goal. And by the way, doing less than that helps some. So even if your walk is not brisk, if you're walking 30 minutes, start there. Uh, any activity at all is better than nothing. And uh, the current recommendations are that for vigorous activity, I believe it's 75 minutes a week. Um, obviously, controlling your blood pressure is an important thing to do. The, the good news is uh, when folks start to change their diet and get physical activity and lose weight, they often are able to come down on blood pressure medication because all of those things impact blood pressure as well. Similarly, because of the risk to the heart, making sure that your lipid profile is in good shape uh, to minimize the risk. And there are things that we can do to lower cholesterol and those that uh, are unsuccessful with diet and exercise. Obviously, smoking is not a good idea, and uh, particularly if you're diabetic, that's going to increase your risk unacceptably. Uh, diet, uh, there are lots of ways to do this, but you know, one of the best pieces of advice, I think, that's starting to come out uh, in the literature, and the literature on nutrition is really tough to interpret because it's usually not a controlled trial. You're trying to ask people to remember what they ate. And so there's a lot of back and forth there. You've probably seen this coffee good, coffee bad, coffee good, coffee bad. And the question becomes, well, is coffee good or bad? And it's hard to tell. But here's what I think. I think that eating real food is critically important. There's something about the uh, either the calorie density or the additives in processed food that starting to emerge now that it is just far less healthy than real food that you get on the uh, uh, the vegetable aisle or the, you know where the fruits and vegetables are. Uh, so uh, that's the best advice I can give. If you are a, a severe diabetic or you want to change things aggressively, then talk to your doctor about uh, programs that can reverse diabetes in some cases. There are surgical techniques for those who are really having problems controlling the weight. Uh, and there are also lifestyle strategies uh, that can dramatically improve blood sugar in, in most uh, patients over time. Uh, I'm not suggesting that all of these things are easy, but we see this happen. And so if it's something that you're passionate about, there are options out there for you to pursue. Obviously, uh, alcohol in moderation is okay, but when you start getting past you know, a couple of drinks a day for men, a, a drink a day for women, uh, you start to get into an area where it's uncertain, and certainly much more than that we know is detrimental to health. Now, the interesting ones that have been added to the list of late are stress and well-being and sleep. Uh, we are starting to understand how important stress is. Stress alone can drive up your blood sugar because it releases what are called, uh, uh, well, it releases adrenaline and, and uh, the, uh, the fright or flight hormones into your bloodstream if you're chronically stressed. And those tend to drive up blood sugar, independent of what you're eating, in fact. And so managing stress, having a way to do that, whether it's a walk in the woods or a you know, or, uh, you know, whether you have a meditation practice or yoga, some way to help you manage stress so it doesn't overwhelm your body. And then sleep. Uh, we used to pride ourselves in, uh, uh, you know, and how little sleep we got and how hard we're working. Well, it turns out that's not good for us. In fact, we can be more productive, more energetic, and reduce our risk for not only diabetes, but the complications of diabetes by getting adequate rest every night. And if you're getting less than six hours, even uh, you know, most people can't get by on less than six hours over the long term, somewhere between six and eight, uh, you can find your sweet spot. But if you can get into a routine and noticing that you automatically wake up, uh, at the time that you're supposed to wake up instead of relying on the alarm to beat you out of the bed. Uh, so those are all really important factors and uh, don't ignore any one of them because they can all contribute. And if you start, uh, you know, addressing those things, and by the way, the, the same activities essentially address those. Exercise, for example, has been shown to reduce stress and depression. Uh, and if you exercise and lose weight, your blood pressure is likely to go down, your cholesterol is likely to get better. Uh, so all of these can work together uh, to enhance the likelihood of reducing your risk of 
of chronic disease, okay? So prevention and treatment. And by the way, this can start uh, now, even before you have prediabetes, because we know the risk is so high with half of adults having some metabolic challenge, uh, it's never too early to start getting upstream of chronic disease and prevent it from happening in the first place. And here we are again, lose weight, eat healthy, engage in regular, moderate physical activity. There are a couple of, of tricks that you can use as well, particularly in that pre-diabetic range. For example, uh, when you're eating a meal, if you can get a little fat and protein on your stomach before you add the carbohydrates, that helps because it slows down the digestion of the carbohydrates, which are turned into sugar uh, in your bloodstream. And if you can do that, then it may reduce the, uh, the spikes in blood sugar, if you will. The other thing that helps a lot is immediately after eating, taking a walk. 30 minute or so walk will make a big difference. And why is that? Well, because you're exercising your muscles, they will use uh, uh, the insulin that you, you, you have available to take glucose up into the muscle. So again, you can reduce that spike in blood sugar by just a couple of simple things that you can do uh, around eating. Medication can be used to control blood sugar levels of well, as well, um, uh, including uh, blood pressure, cholesterol, uh, and that may also prevent heart attack and stroke. The other interesting medication that's out there for uh, diabetics, you may have heard of it, is uh, metformin. And metformin is a, a medication that doesn't cause low blood sugar, but it can help manage diabetes. And I don't want people to be too concerned about metformin uh, as being a diabetes med because there's some interesting data that metformin actually improves the outcomes in diabetics in terms of longevity uh, and, and quality of life. So there's some very interesting positive side effects of metformin as opposed to many of the other drugs, which have some negative uh, uh, side effects as well as the positives uh, associated with treating diabetes. Okay. Did you know you can lower diabetes and heart disease risks by controlling your blood sugar? Heart disease and stroke are the number one killers among people with type 2 diabetes. Blood glucose, or sugar, is an important fuel for your body. When it's at the recommended level, that's normal. But when it's too high, that can lead to diabetes. Insulin is a hormone that is important for controlling blood glucose levels. But if your glucose levels become too high or too low, your body can have trouble producing a hormone called insulin that it needs to stay healthy. When your body doesn't produce enough insulin or it doesn't efficiently use the insulin it makes, your blood sugar may become too high. When this happens, your body's cells cannot use the sugar in your blood and the cells can be starved for energy. Over time, high blood sugar levels can damage your eyes, kidneys, nerves, or heart. You can lower your blood sugar by eating better. Eating a diet full of fruits, vegetables, whole grains, low-fat dairy products, poultry, fish, and nuts, while limiting sugary foods and beverages to promote a healthy lifestyle. Finally, always remember to talk with your own medical provider to discuss the best plan of action for your health. So if you've been diagnosed with prediabetes or uh, diabetes, first of all, you're not alone. And there are lots of folks walking around who haven't gotten the diagnosis yet. Uh, but it's not uh, uh, as severe as you might initially think, because if you do the right things and if you monitor your health and work with your physician, find out what programs may be available for you to address this. You can control your blood sugar level. You can control your blood cholesterol and your blood pressure, and you can uh, have a much better and longer life by reducing the risk of stroke and Alzheimer's disease and kidney disease, and the list goes on. It's estimated that as much as half of the chronic disease in the country today 
may be related to these metabolic syndromes, including prediabetes and diabetes. So it's important information. Uh, clearly, we have uh, a, a societal issue that we need to address because these diseases are rising so rapidly in the population. And again, some simple things, getting a little bit of activity helps so much. Uh, losing a little bit of weight, as little as 5%, makes a huge difference uh, in outcomes. And eating real food, you know, eat food uh, as it was intended before it gets mashed up and, uh, you know, cr uh, crunched into chips or whatever else. Uh, eat real food, and that will go a long way towards creating that healthy life that we all want. And I'm going to turn it back over to you, Corinne, for the resources. Perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Groves. Thank you so much for that information. Uh, we have some great resources listed here. Uh, like I said, we will be sending out these slides to everybody. I know these websites are kind of hard for like typing out, but you will have the access to them. So there's more information at heart.org when it comes to diabetes, as well as information uh, for resources on how to live with type two diabetes um, called No Diabetes by Heart. That is a project between the American Heart Association and the American Diabetes Association. And then we also have uh, resources called Empowered to Serve. And so those are like kind of presentations that have information on advocacy to help to encourage us to get going in the community. Uh, we talked about eating healthy, but if you live in a neighborhood that doesn't have a grocery store, that could be really difficult. And so talking about you know advocating for there to be more grocery stores or there to be easier access, which is like Door the Cure, which is our network for advocacy to um, work also on policy changes that can help to make things better so people can live healthier lives. Um, on behalf of Banner Aetna and the American Heart Association, I hope you found today's information beneficial and we'll take action and share what you've learned. We do have time for questions, so I'll start with the ones that were submitted during the presentation. And then as you had additional ones, please type them into the Q&A box and I will um, get them for Dr. Gross. So uh, we might not have time for all of them live though. So we will do our very, very best. Um, and the slides can come down now, Alicia. So first question was, any insights into peptide like epameralin or HCG to assist with degenerative tissues, even stem cell injection? Yeah, you know, it's an interesting area of research right now. There's a tremendous amount of research going on. Most of it, however, is still in animals. And there are tons of different kinds of peptides that are signaling molecules. Insulin is a peptide. So, uh, you know, they are signaling molecules. I don't think we understand enough about it yet to make broad recommendations, uh, but I don't doubt that there's some wisdom in those peptides. And, and uh, you know, similarly with stem cells, we've heard uh, that they have a huge amount of potential, but they're also um, overhyped uh, in some settings and, and uh, commercialized in some settings. I'm not uh, uh, opposed to the research. I think it needs to be done, and I think we will find uses for all of these uh, strategies. Today, it's tough as a physician to recommend any of them because we don't have enough human research to understand not only what are the benefits, but you know what are the risks. And, and risks sometimes can be delayed. And so we want to make sure that we're careful in moving forward with these kinds of therapies to make sure that we don't hurt anybody. First, do no harm. Yeah, definitely. And the American Heart Association agrees we fund so much research, but the whole, the whole point is to, to have it where you can really see what the long-term effects are so that then you know that what you're doing really is, is helping. Yeah, and you know, there are amazing anecdotes, stories of people responding to, to various therapies, including stem cells and, and, and peptides of various kinds, uh, but they aren't studies yet. Uh, you know, you, you have to control for bias, you have to control uh, for the placebo effect, which can be extremely powerful. Uh, you know, the body's abil ability to heal itself with a belief 
uh, is truly remarkable. And if you're interested in, in the placebo effect and how it can uh, mess with us when we're trying to, to study drugs, uh, you know, just Google uh, placebo effect. I think you'll be astonished at how powerful that effect can be. Now, uh, frankly, I don't mind harnessing the placebo effect uh, because I don't, you know, I don't mind if my patients get better uh, without my help. I, I, I would encourage that, but it really is a powerful effect. And so understanding what really works and what doesn't but fooled us is a very difficult task and it takes time uh, and, and lots of resources to, to tease out the, the real winners in the game, I guess. Uh, someone else was asking you about gestational diabetes and how it increases your risk, but even after you've had the baby and the gestational diabetes goes away, uh, why is your risk still increased for getting diabetes later? You know, I, I, it, it's, I'm not sure that I have an answer to that. I think the way to think about it is because uh, gestational diabetes developed, it was already someone who is at risk. And so I'm not sure which came first, the chicken or the egg, I guess is what I'm saying. And my, my current opinion, and it can change over time if the facts change, is that uh, these are folks that probably are already at risk uh, for diabetes, and that's why it showed up in pregnancy when there's that additional stress on, on mom to take care of, uh, uh, of two bodies. Another question is, it says, Verda Health promotes high-fat, low-carb diet. What is the impact of a high-fat diet on your heart health? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, fortunately, uh, we have some data in that regard. Uh, they have about five years of data now on folks on a high-fat ketogenic, uh, what they call a well-formulated ketogenic diet. And uh, the data suggests there's no increased heart risk. Now, let me caution you, though. If you are eating high-fat, you also have to be generating ketones, in other words, in ketosis. And there are lots of reasons why that's true, and ketones are signaling molecules themselves. If you eat high fat along with high carbs, that's the worst combination. Uh, so for example, we know that uh, uh, the uh, uh, Dean Ornish strategy works to reduce the risk of heart disease. He's, he's done that many times. That's mostly you know, vegetables. Uh, there's not a lot of uh, protein and not a lot of fat at all in that diet. We know that works. If you go to the full on, you know, high fat diet, there's evidence now, at least out five years, that at a minimum, there's no increased risk of, of heart disease. But if you look in the middle, that's where all the risk is. And so it's one of those weird situations where uh, if you're going to go in, you got to go all in and, and uh, make sure that you're monitoring that. Uh, because I wouldn't want to, uh, I would not personally want to eat high fat and uh, even moderate carbohydrates, uh, because I think that is an unnecessary risk. And then someone else was talking about gestational diabetes and that, um, you know, is that something you can prevent? Can you prevent getting gestational diabetes? You know, that's a great question. And uh, I guess, uh, logic would suggest that if you are doing those things that would prevent and or treat prediabetes before you get pregnant and while you're pregnant, that it would reduce the risk. But we have to be careful there because we don't want mom to skimp on, uh, you know, adequate calories uh, for uh, the other body she's taken care of. And so I, I, most people find out that they have gestational diabetes because they get tested for it. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's kind of hard to predict. Uh, it is not uncommon, but it's not uh, common either. It's, it's, uh, uh, I don't think we know enough about it to be able to say anything other than a healthy lifestyle is certainly healthy for a healthy pregnancy and may go some distance in preventing that. And again, it, you know, that's getting activity, that's uh, eating well, that's getting sleep and managing stress. And moms are saying, yeah, manage stress? <laughs> Give me a hand here. Sleep? What? 
Um, someone else was asking about suggestions on how to maintain a healthy weight, but they reference when someone is losing too much weight. Like if someone is losing weight too quickly or too much. Yeah. Um, you know, you can get sophisticated estimates of calorie needs and count calories and do those sorts of things. But I, you know, I, I, my, the best advice for somebody who is, who is losing weight is a very balanced diet. You want to get adequate, all of the macros. You want to get, make sure you're getting vitamins and a variety of fruits and vegetables. You want to make sure you're getting adequate protein. And if you're losing weight, you want to make sure you get adequate fat as well. Uh, so I, I don't have any magic for that. Someone who's losing weight and it's unexplained, that's an indication you need to go check with your primary care physician and say, hey, not sure what's up. I seem to be eating normally, but I'm still losing weight to make sure that there's not something else going on. That's what, that's what I was thinking too, is that there sounds like there might be an underlying condition there too. Um, question, does type two turn into type one if your pancreas stops working? Yeah, that's, that, you know, it, the definition, the answer is no, definitional, definitionally, I think I'm going to coin a word there, I'm not sure, uh, but type one is by definition, you start, your diabetes starts with the absence of insulin being made by the pancreas. Now, it's true that in type two diabetes, over time, uh, the pancreas uh, kind of gets worn out and starts to significantly reduce the amount of insulin it makes. And so that, you know, there's a, a, a sharing of mechanisms there in a way. But remember, the type 2 diabetic has been dealing long term with insulin resistance, which is what started that uh, uh, process. So technically, no, uh, two doesn't become one, although you may exhaust your pancreas's ability to make normal amounts of insulin. And then a couple of folks have asked about is diabetes, does it affect the amount of fat that you have in your liver? Yes. Uh, and, and so does metabolic syndrome and so does prediabetes. There's something called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. We didn't talk about that today. Uh, but it's certainly true that the metabolic syndromes increase the deposition of fat in all the organs. Uh, it turns out, paradoxically, that uh, uh, diabetes results in a lot of that uh, excess carbohydrate being turned into fat, and that energy is stored as fat, uh, ultimately. And it, Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is also something that's rising very quickly. Those, there are those who predict that in, in five years, it may be the number one reason for liver transplant. Now, that sounds dramatic. Liver transplants aren't all that common, but uh, certainly something to pay attention to with the number of people that have this non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. It can lead to failure of the liver uh, and cirrhosis and, and look like, you know, viral hepatitis, uh, if you will. I mean, diagnostically, it's different, but the liver can actually fail uh, and uh, require transplantation. Now, it turns out that uh, reducing body weight and controlling blood sugar and aggressively pursuing that will reverse fatty liver disease too. So uh, the, there's a common pathway to addressing all of the consequences of high blood sugar. Um, someone says, you know, water is generally really good for the body. Is there also a benefit of increasing your water intake when it comes to your blood sugar? Uh, you know, certainly uh, water intake is important to, to you know, maintain uh, your, your kidneys and to make sure that you're adequately hydrated, can keep your blood pressure up. All of those things are important. And yes, if your blood is concentrated, it might, uh, you know, hypothetically have a higher level of relative uh, glucose in the blood but it won't actually reduce, uh, the, it won't treat the problem. It might make it more manageable, but you wanna to get to the root of the problem and treat that. Certainly you wanna stay hydrated. I'm not suggesting that that's not true, but I have to caution you too, that there's been so much uh, written about how much water you should drink. And, and the jury is still really out on that. I'm not sure that we all need eight pints a day of water. 
Uh, but I'm not sure that we don't. I, I don't think that the evidence is clear. It turns out that a lot of the studies on fluid intake were done by uh, companies that had a vested interest in fluid intake, like Gatorade, for example, uh, in the 60s. And, and that's where a lot of that information came from. And those studies are not as rigorous as the scientific studies that have been done since that call that into question. I'm not telling you don't drink water, mind you. I'm just saying that the, uh, the literature is a little fuzzy on exactly how much is necessary. There are many in the scientific community now who think our thirst mechanisms work pretty well. In other words, drink when you're thirsty. Awesome. And I know here for Arizona in particular, that is very important to have water because when it's so hot, you just sort of- And it's dry. And if you're outside and exercising, uh, that's a great time to tank up before you go out to take water with you. Uh, because those, once you go into a high heat situation, you can lose those signals. Thank you, Corinne. That's a very important point in Arizona. Um, someone mentioned that they've been a type one diabetic for almost 30 years and that their doctor has increased their insulin recommendations and that they've been having weight gain. And they were wondering what they can do to stop weight gain that's caused uh, or as a result of the insulin. Yeah, I, you know, that's such a tough one because it turns out that insulin uh, it does tend to stimulate uh, weight gain. I mean, we know this and, and uh, increasing the dose, you know, predictably is gonna make that harder to manage. Uh, I don't have a simple answer for you, except to say that, uh, uh, you know, you have to be very rigorous about, you know, what your, you know, the input, uh, because you're gonna process it differently. Um, you know, unfortunately, some of the programs like Verda aren't yet available to type one diabetics, not because they're necessarily harmful, but because they haven't been studied well enough uh, for everyone to be comfortable that, uh, that that's the way to go. But if you go back in time before the, uh, before insulin was isolated and, and uh, made into a medication, uh, ketosis was the way that type one diabetics originally were treated. Uh, it's not as effective as insulin by a long shot. And so in type one diabetics, there's always going to be a requirement for some insulin because it's just it, it, your body needs it to process energy, uh, but there may be options out there uh, 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 for a strategy that might be able to help you come down on it a little bit. Certainly exercise, uh, managing weight, uh, managing stress, getting enough sleep. That's the first place I'd go uh, uh, to manage that problem. And all four of those are important. I think people sort of ignore the, you know, it's like, yeah, yeah, sleep, stress critically important. You know, when you don't sleep, <clears throat> there are a number of things that happen. <clears throat> uh, all of the systems in your body don't work as well. You don't flush all the toxins out like you're supposed to, particularly in your brain. Uh, and you are predisposed to make decisions that are not in your best interest. You tend to go for comfort food. You tend to cut corners. You tend to forget stuff. So uh, sleep is one of those foundational things that you just have to get. So figuring that out in stress management, sometimes that needs to come before you get to, I'm going to change my diet and I'm going to exercise more. You got to have the energy and the will to do those things. And that requires sleep and stress management. And um, our last question for today, uh, someone heard from their friend that there's a medication for people who are diabetic, but it also helps you lose weight. Do you know what that medication is? And is it safe for people who don't have diabetes? Yeah, semaglutide uh, is the name of the medication. And that indication uh, just was uh, approved by, by the FDA. And, uh, it, you know, it, it's early in uh, the use of the, my dad. Uh, who was a, a, a general practitioner in South Georgia growing up, always said, never be the first or the last to use any medication. And I think there's some, some wisdom in that. Uh, and it's kind of like the vaccines, you know, in the clinical trials, when they did uh, clinical trials with the vaccines, they didn't see any signals. But once bunches of people started taking them, then we saw the myocarditis signal. So, uh, you, you know, I... I I think there's going to be something there. I think it'll be interesting uh, to see how it all pans out. Uh, uh, 
and and if weight is a serious problem there that's the folks that are starting on it first you know and morbid obesity those folks are getting a shot at that first uh, but uh, we are learning stuff every day the science gets better and better and uh, I, although I you know, there's part of me that, uh, gosh, if we've got a pill for everything, do we just, you know, sit around and veg? <laughs> I worry about that, but uh, th it is out there, it is coming, and it may be an option for many, many people in, in the very near future. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Groves. Um, that's all the time we have for today for, for questions. Um, everyone, thank you for joining us for Diabetes in Your Heart with Dr. Groves from Banner Aetna. Tomorrow morning, you're going to receive an email with a link to the recording of this session, a PDF of the presentation, and then a link to a feedback survey. It's a quick survey. So please let us know how we did and what you learned. And if you complete the survey, you'll be entered to win a Starbucks gift card. And there's going to be several winners, so your chances aren't bad. So please fill out that survey for us. And of course, thank you for coming and have a great afternoon.